Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's webinar um, being hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator for the partnership and we're very happy that you could join us today. Uh, today's presentation is um, being given by the Playa Lakes Joint Venture and it's one example of landscape conservation design. So the Desert LCC is currently exploring landscape conservation design and we're looking to examples that are out there um, across the country. Um, so this one's actually even from outside of our region. Uh, we're looking to partnerships like the Joint Ventures who've been uh, working on landscape design for a long time and we're also looking to other examples. So you, you may see more of these webinars in the future. Um, we're interested in embarking on landscape conservation design within the Desert LCC geography, and so we're exploring the different ways that people have been doing this. Um, and this is in support of the Fish and Wildlife Services Initiative on Strategic Habitat Conservation, um, and also in support of our many other partners um, in the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And so today I'm going to ask Carol Beardmore, who is the science coordinator for the Sonoran Joint Venture and is my co-chair on the science working group for the Desert LCC, to introduce our speaker. Hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ann Bartasavage, who's the conservation science director for the Playa Lakes Joint Venture to uh, give this webinar. Um, it, it was an easy choice, I think, for me to think of the Playa Lakes because I, I feel that they are one of the leaders in, in landscape conservation design within the joint venture world. Um, Anne joined the PLJV in 2008 as conservation science director and she has much in expertise in grassland ecosystems, avian science, and private lands conservation, working in various, with various partner organizations such as the Forest Service, Farm Services Agency, NRCS, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, Anne and I have co-conspired on uh, starting a working group within the uh, joint venture uh, science world, and uh, I consider her a, a leader in this area. Um, Anne, welcome. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for joining me today. I'm excited to talk about landscape design. This is something that the joint venture has been, um, it's a concept that's been involved, evolving in the joint venture for uh, quite some time. and. And uh, so it's it's nice to be able to share our thoughts um, with everybody and to get feedback. Um, so please uh, save you know write down your questions. Make sure that you ask me them at the end so that uh, we can get some good feedback and some good discussion going. And Anne, this is Amy again. If you can speak up at all, um, we're still having a little trouble hearing you. Okay, is this better? I think so. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, this is this is a slide from I don't know 2006 or seven in the joint venture in in the P PLJV implementation plan. This is how we started thinking about landscapes, and you know, basically to do landscape conservation is essentially working in a gigantic puzzle. Um, you have a landscape in its current condition, say on the left hand side of your screen and it's going to change over some period of time to maybe something that looks like on the right hand side of the screen and um, in, in traditionally in the way we think about conservation is that we're losing the things that we want to have and we're, we're gaining more other things like urban expansion and, and um, cropland and things like that. But our goal with the joint ventures is you know, basically we're trying to figure out how we can still support all the birds that we're responsible for um, on this uh, changing landscape. And so, uh, so we've been doing this landscape level pl of planning for a long time, and landscape design is sort of a natural progression of this. And it's um, something that's found in the literature um, 
it, there's a lot of discussion about this um, from European and Australian scientists. Um, and we have, uh, within our joint venture, developed our own definition based very much on what um, is being discussed in the literature. Uh, so this uh, definition is not anything um, different from what's being said um, by some of the leaders in the landscape design science. And we have defined landscape design as um, something that integrates societal values, sets biological goals, and uses sound science based in landscape ecology to provide a variety of scenario plans that describe where conservation can best be achieved and how it relates to measurable goals. So um, there's a few things in there that are very important. Um, the first is that um, it sets biological goals. Um, we think this is important because um, we need really, it, it, when you're doing planning, it helps to have an endpoint in mind. You know, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you've achieved what it is that you set out to achieve? So they should be um, quantifiable goals. Um, the landscape design um, explicitly considers humans in its planning. So it acknowledges that humans have a need for economy and society and uh, basically that we're not going anywhere. And, and so we need to plan with, uh, with, with humans in mind. And then the other third part that is important to us in this definition is that it is based in the scientific literature. So if we think about how uh, traditionally we go about conservation planning and conservation design, um, in, you know, we have a goal, uh, we uh, look to understand the current landscape pattern and process, we know what the current you know, conditions are out there, and then you know, we try to make a conservation plan, a conservation design. And um, what is different about uh, landscape design is all this part in the middle. And so um, we're going to go through an example that will take us through all these different parts. Um, but I want to point out a few things here. Uh, first is the goal, which is at the top. And we evaluate our progress towards that goal at every step. Uh, so it's important to sort of continually revisit that goal, make sure that um, our plans and, and the, the ideas that we have are going to move us towards um, achieving and accomplishing our goals. Uh, the green boxes are the uh, landscape, the, the different landscapes, the current, the, the projected future, and this landscape conservation design. Uh, what do we want the uh, landscape to look like you know, with our conservation actions? The two white diamonds, these are very important because these are where we start engaging partners. And you know, so here, you know, you have in making the landscape um, and using the GIS, it's more of a technical thing. Um, and, and more of a data, data analysis sort of process. But here, when we talk about drivers, you know, this is where we got to talk to our partners and say, okay, what is it that's acting on this landscape that is um, causing you heartburn in your job? And then what do we need to model about this? And then also in the conservation opportunities, once we know uh, where the landscape is headed, uh, how do we how do we address that, and how do we get conservation on the ground and in places that it makes the most sense? So uh, we have finished a pilot project with partners in Colorado, in New Mexico, and um, this was uh, funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And so I'll just take you through this uh, pilot project. And uh, before I start that, it occurs to me that I did not uh, show you guys where the Playa Lakes Joint Venture is. And so here we are. This is this red outline um, working in Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, the Panhandle of Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado. Uh, this is basically the short grass prairie and most of the mixed grass prairie. Um, this part in Nebraska that's also mixed br grass prairie is um, uh, is the Rainwater Basin Joint Venture. And uh, for those of you who are LCC type, this landscape is the uh, Great Plains Landscape Conservation Cooperative area. So uh, 
PLJV worked with partners in, in Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, we are developing a landscape design for playas. And uh, when we started, we realized we needed to get some just basic information about the landscape that we were working in. And so we wanted to really just understand what areas were already protected, what areas are kind of uh, quote unquote lost due to permanent societal infrastructure. And then that would give us an idea of what was left or available um, for us to um, try to deliver conservation. Uh, so we started out uh, thinking about protected areas, and we thought, oh, that'll be easy. Protected areas are protected, right? And then we started digging into the different agencies and the different um, mandates that the different agencies have and realized that there's many, uh, that the idea of protection is a little bit nuanced. And so we came up with three categories of protection. And um, this area just shows a, a, a cutout of, the air, of an area in New Mexico that illustrates these different categories. So there's permanent protection, and these are lands that are protected in perpetuity, and that's from surface development and also from mineral extraction. Things like uh, National Park Service lands would fall into this category. The next category, the multiple use permanent, so these are things that are um, protected by federal or state uh, authority, but um, they have maybe a multiple use mandate on their properties, and so they may this area may be developed for mineral extraction or say wind energy development or something like that. So uh, things like Bureau of Land Management and Forest or uh, yeah U U.S. Forest Service lands would uh, qualify under that category. And then finally, um, this idea of temporary protection. Um, these are lands that are protected under a term-limited lease. Uh, the most common uh, type of that protection in our region is the Conservation Reserve Program. So that's a 15-year lease for um, producers to take land out of production and plant back to grass. Um, the next thing we wanted to understand was this uh, idea of where, where is the permanent societal infrastructure? And this was an interesting discussion because, you, you know, there's a lot of human infrastructure out there on the landscape. And really, when we started looking into the literature and thinking about um, the priority species that we have, we realized that um, all those species react differently and associate differently with the, the different uh, human infrastructures on the on the landscape, so uh, telephone poles and utility lines and uh, roads and oil and gas fields and things like that. Um, but when we got down to it, we realized that there are two things that, for our priority species, we realize they, they don't really interact with them positively, say at all, and that would be cities and roads. These impervious surfaces. And so uh, we mapped the cities and roads in our region. This is the same area in New Mexico as the previous slide. Um, and, so that, and then we decided that things like oil and gas fields and, and utility lines and things like that could be dealt with on a, on a, a more species by species or a guild by guild process. Um, and, and in addition, those things can be removed. It's, it's very difficult and and uh, they may be on the landscape for many, many years, but um, things like oil and gas wells can be removed and reclaimed. And so uh, we felt like there were um, at least some conservation opportunities with other types of infrastructure. So when you add the two layers together, the protected layer and then the societal infrastructure layer, uh, basically what remains is the available for conservation. And this is the areas where we're going to be doing landscape scale models to understand the, the patterns and the processes acting on the landscape and be able to figure out where we need to deliver more conservation. Um, in those models, we also include the protected layers. Um, 
the way we think about this is that, you know, for the protected layers, uh, we already have a, a, a ready set partner available with um, with the federal agencies or the state agencies that, that serve on our management board, and you know probably serve on your steering committees as well. You know, so we can already sort of go to our steering committee or management board member and say, hey, you know, there's some opportunities on um, Forest Service grasslands. You know, let's let's try to work together and get something going on there. Um, but the, the private lands that surround it, that's where we really need to be very strategic and, and understand what is happening out there so that we can go in uh, with, a, with a pretty, uh, pretty good idea and a, and a very good plan for, of action for the conservation. So again, this is the um, available with, for conservation without the uh, protected and the, the infrastructure layers. So uh, the next example is this, um, I want to take you through the playa, the specific playa example uh, for the PLJV. And again, this was part of the um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that funded our pilot project on the landscape design. So playas are ephemeral wetlands uh, in the short grass and, and mixed grass prairie, mostly in the short grass prairie. Um, playas are found globally in semi-arid grassland regions, and they have these similar characteristics in which they are <laughs> they're filled uh, by runoff, so um, large convective rainstorms, thunderstorms uh, will fill these. We need about uh, an inch of rain in 24 hours in order for the wetlands to fill. Uh, the playas are important for recharging the high plains or Ogallala aquifer. And so the water is lost to recharge or it's evaporated. Um, there, is, there are no other inlets or outlets uh, for that water. It's a closed basin system. But they're very, very important for supporting migrating birds and migrating waterfowl. And so we went through this example in which we wanted to um, determine a landscape design for a migrating waterfowl. Our goal was 19.6 million duck use days, uh, with, and we want to support that 19.6 million duck use days with grassland playas. Um, a duck use day is a measure of energy. It uh, basically the limiting factor for migrating birds um, is is thought to be food resources and energy, the ability to fly from one place to another, and so um, there's a, a fair amount of science. Uh, that uh, understands the, the amount of kilocalories in, in wetland plants and that's and what that is available to waterfowl. And so that's measured in a duck use days and it's basically the amount of energy needed to support one duck for one day. And so for, if we're saying 19.6 million duck use days, that means we want to support 19.6 million ducks for one day or one duck for 19.6 million days. So. Uh, think about it in those terms. So again, we want to support these birds with grassland playas. Um, we could support them with cropland playas, but waste grain is not, uh, it's not nutritionally very good for ducks, and, and also it seems a little bit like if we're going to be trying to do conservation for natural landscapes that we don't want to actively be uh, um, supporting the, you know, the idea that we should um, plow under grasslands um, to support ducks. So uh, if we look at our current landscape, and these are the playas in Colorado and New Mexico, and we look at the ones that are in grasslands, and then um, in the past there's been a number of uh, hydrological modifications to these playas. Uh, this is a high farming area, and so um, playas are dry probably nine out of ten years. Uh, that one year when they are wet, uh, it's sort of a, 
<laughs> messes up your farm field, quite frankly. And so what people will do is dig a pit in the middle of the wetland to drain all that water into the middle of it. And that uh, basically um, uh, upsets the hydrologic function of that playa and that wetland. And so we assume that probably 30% of the playas in our region are pitted and are thus you no know, longer useful for waterfowl because they won't grow the appropriate type of plants to support those birds. And then, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier here, only you know, the plies are only wet uh, one year out of 10. And so if we say that we do a little loose interpretation of that and say that 10% of the plies are wet in any one year, uh, we start subtracting that from the am amount of plies that are on our landscape. There's 9,000 in, you know, in those two states. And we, we use those assumptions, we end up with 366 playas that meet all those assumptions, are in grassland, are not pitted, and will be wet in, in one year. And we assume a certain amount of energy associated with wet playas, and that gets us to 3.6 million duck use days, or about 19% towards our goal. So we already have quite a bit of work to do with just um, trying to get towards the, the, our entire goal of 19.6 million uh, duck use days. So this is an example of modeling and, and understanding the current landscape pattern and process that, that's happening in our region. Now we could go straight to um, what would we do if we could, um, you know, if we, to making a conservation plan straight to the end. And in which case, you know, like I said, there's almost 9,000 playas in the area. If we assume that a third of them have pits and a third of them are in croplands, um, we could fix all of those playas. And I, by fix, I mean we could fill in those pits. We could put a grass buffer around the, the cropland playas. And we would get 50% towards our goal. Or we could um, work, we could do half of those number of playas and get 44% towards our goal. So we could, um, what we're talking about in our, what we talk about in our office is doing the right ones. So that is basically unpitting grassland playas and buffering crop playas that uh, don't have a pit in them. And so this is an example, we, we want to work uh, strategically, we want to work smart and, and, and not necessarily as hard as we can. We want to work smart within our, uh, within our goals and in, in our capacity. So here I've just shown, you know, we've got this current landscape and we've got the conservation opportunities. Um, next, what I want to show you is working through the drivers and, and modeling a future landscape uh, in, in this flow chart. So if we look through this and say, well, what if some percent of the grassland playas are, far, are farmed? Um, so we have models that will um, we have a, a, a tillage likelihood model, and that's based on um, data about what what uh, crop fields are already plowed, what characteristics of those areas um, are, you know, what are the, the ecological characteristics of those fields that are plowed, and then projecting that onto the broader landscape um, to, ter to determine uh, the, the likelihood of another field being plowed in the future. Um, so if we lose some percent of grassland playas, um, you know, we might lose, if we look at, look at that model, we see that we'll lose 4% towards our goal. And so instead of, like, you know, from the start, we've already lost, you know, we haven't even left our office, we haven't even finished modeling yet, and we're already behind our goal, uh, you know, it, where we were at before. So, um, so instead of our, baseline being 19% towards our goal, now we're at only 15% of our goal because we um, may lose these playas to future um, tillage.
so if we look at this and we say, okay, well here, if we look at the playas and look at the models and we say, okay, we want to, um, we, we want to look and see our, where are the playas that are in a high risk uh, tillage likelihood area. So say have a greater than 50% risk of being tilled um, in the next five years. Um, if we look at those, we realize that there's you know, about 360 of those playas. And if we went out and, active, and actively sought and, and talk to those landowners, uh, we could um, put those playas in, say, a WRP or in a um, or in other some other kind of easement program, and then we gain back sort of some of that uh, some of that amount of playas that we would have lost. We would have gained we would gain back one percent towards our goal. On the other side of that, if we looked at playas that have a um, tillage risk um, I'm sorry I'm talking faster than my slides I'm not paying attention to them so if, if we look at um, the the tillage risk and say okay we there are a certain number of playas that are already being tilled but um, or maybe in an area where the, the soils are not that great um, and, and the, the, the tillage likelihood model says, okay, well, these areas probably would never have been um, tilled based on these current landscape uh, predictors. So maybe those are um, producers that are having maybe a, maybe a difficult time um, earning money on those landscapes. So we may be able to approach them, this um, offer to put them into some kind of a, a grassland buffer program where we, where the government may lease that land from them to put back into a grassland, and then, um, and so then the producer can sort of get that land out of production that they're working really hard to earn almost no money at, um, and and still earn some income through some uh, farm subsidy programs. And if we do those things, we can earn back that 4% that was lost, um, that we, you know, that we sort of discovered uh, when we were doing the tillage likelihood modeling. So the idea then is that um, from there, we could uh, find a, uh, identify specific playas in specific regions. So we could track down these about approximately 900 playas and go to those areas and say these, this is, these are the areas that we need to um, put grassland buffers on. And you know, these are the playas that that needs to happen at. Uh, these other playas, these are ones that are already in grass. We need to work hard to get those and keep those in grass. And so you get a very specific uh, design and a map that tells you, you know, what specific areas you need to go to and what uh, conservation opportunities you have in those areas and which ones do you need to be promoting. So we're back here at the, um, at the landscape design definition. Um, just to remind you of what it is that we're trying to do. We're trying to integrate societal values and set biological goals and again use sound science uh, to be able to create these landscape designs. Um, so with that, I'll end there and take any questions. Okay, folks, so as a reminder, you can um, either raise your hand on the participants list or go ahead and unmute yourself using star six, and we will take your questions. All right, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Um, does anyone have any questions? Go ahead and speak up. Be sure to unmute yourself with star six.
maybe I'll get us started here, um, Anne. Mm -hmm. So um, about how much time uh, did it take you to um, build this version of landscape design here for the joint venture? Uh, the pilot project took about um, six months, I think. Um, just, and, and we had been talking about these concepts in landscape design and doing literature reviews and things like that for uh, probably six months before that, just trying to get our wrap our heads around it. And we came up with a um, sort of a list of standards. What do we need? To, what what metrics? What marks do we need to hit in order to make sure that we're getting a complete picture of landscape design. And um, so the pilot project was designed to basically work with partners and work through this this list of, of metrics that we had identified um, in order to um, make sure that our thinking was correct and that we had really thought through all of those different steps, which is kind of why I, I brought up about the um, uh, uh, the protected areas, like thinking that protected areas were going to be easy to define, you know, and then getting into the middle of it and realizing, oh, no, that's not. Um, the one thing that's interesting about this is that um, you so starting from scratch, it can take a while because you have to figure out the models and figure out the drivers and things like that. The interesting thing is that, you know, in our area there is a um, – the northern Bob White is of conservation concern, and there's a whole um, national Bob White conservation initiative. And in that um, initiative, they identify, you know, sort of the drivers, the the impacts, and they identify conservation opportunities, what conservation needs there are in the different landscapes. So, uh, with a plan like that, we could um, we could jump right in and, and sort of pick up at the end and just design something, uh, a spatially explicit conservation opportunity. In that case, it wouldn't take that long because most of the other work's been done for us, right? So it, the interesting thing about this, I think, is that you know we really can um, sort of design a landscape design for our own purposes and our own internal joint venture uses, but, or we can work with the um, uh, or we can work with the, um, you know, with partners um, to, uh, you know, with their plans and what they've already identified to, to design something um, spatially explicit. Um, I'm stumbling a little bit because I'm getting a few questions in here, so I'm scanning them as I'm talking. <laughs> so before I go to oh, them, okay, does, that answer, does that answer your question, Amy? It does, yep. Does that help? Okay. Thank you. I can't see the questions, so it, people must be saying them directly to you, so go ahead. Yeah, it all says privately at the end of them, so they must be just going directly to me. So uh, one question, uh, how did you determine 19.6 million duck use days? That's from the North American Waterfall Management Plan. Uh, so they, um, the, that um, management plan has a continental objective, uh, and so all the joint ventures have taken that continental objective and stepped it down to their own joint venture boundaries. And then we uh, uh, parsed out that that number um, to each of our different state and VCR regions. So that's where we came with the 19.6 million ducky state target. Um, so what was the biological goal of the analysis? Um, again, that was the uh, uh, that was the duck use, the number of duck use days, and we were measuring in, in playa acres. Um, so uh, what we said is basically each acre, playas range in size from just a small, you know, like a half acre all the way up to some of them, there are, some of them are um, several hundred acres. And so um, each, uh, for some of the wetland data we have about playas indicates that there's about um, 1,300 kilocalories of energy for every acre of playa. So we're just, it's a strict you know, number of playa acres times 1,300 kilocalories um, gets us into the, the duck use days model. So um, we're trying to increase the number of playa acres. Um, Yes, so I hope um, Kat 
if you can let me know if I answer your question. Um, uh, then there is another, there's some questions about the tillage risk um, models. That, those were worked out with um, partners from NRCS, the Lesser Prairie Chicken Conservation Initiative, uh, Farm Services Agency, um, and the Nature Conservancy. And um, I am not aware of any controversy surrounding the model inputs or the outputs. Um, uh, so um, I'm sure that somebody will have something to say about that in the future, but uh, we'll have to deal with that then. Um, what is our plan for monitoring to relate to the measurable goal? Um, for pliants, it's actually kind of easy because we are just doing, you know, it's really, we just want to count how many plyas have been, um, have, we've filled in pits or put grassland buffers around. Um, so we can um, literally j just count those when they come in, um, you know, from different partner projects and things like that. Um, for other birds and for other projects, we have this uh, database, uh, the hierarchical all bird system, and it basically um, uses uh, monitoring data that, to understand the density of birds on the landscape in certain um, habitats. And then we have a six-state land cover um, where we can uh, basically count up the amount of habitat that we have, say, short grass prairie, and, and do a simple density multiplication, the you know, number of birds per acre times the number of acres or that, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is coming in fast and furious, so I'm trying to scroll back up to, our <laughs> to the question I'm trying to answer. Um, so uh, so our, our uh, monitoring is basically using some monitoring data from other partners and sort of estimating the capacity of the landscape to, to support those birds. Um, but we do have plans to work with, um, try to get some more um, direct monitoring data um, and work with Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory um, for that. Um, how reliable is a tillage model? Um, I'm not. Sure. Um, I don't think that we've done, this was just a pilot project and so we have not yet um, sort of compared that to other, um, say the, the CLU layer, the, uh, the, Nash, the National Agricultural Statistics Service data to get any sort of formal um, estimate on how, how accurate we are on that. But I, I don't recall hearing anything in the office that makes us that gives us heartburn about that. But that's a good question. That's something we should definitely do is, is um, check, um, check on that. Um, again, I think the tillage model is pretty reliable, but we definitely do need to do some, um, um, some validation of that model before we go too much further. Um, let's see. Can we do landscape design with more than one goal? Um, could you add a goal of amphibian habitat to the waterfowl goal, and how would the landscape design be impacted? So that's really interesting. Um, the you can definitely do more than one goal, um, although it's probably easiest to do the goal use goals that are uh, at similar spatial scales. So, for example, birds and amphibians would be really hard to incorporate into one single uh, conservation design, landscape design, because mostly the, the amphibians are going to be, you know, um, uh, dispersing just within a few, you know, probably less than a half a kilometer um, of the original playa, uh, whereas birds can, you know, they can. Uh, some of our models are based on the foraging distance of northern pintail, and that's like five kilometers. And so um, just those spatial disparities would be very uh, uh, difficult. Um, and so, uh, but things like, um, you know, we want to support uh, migrating waterfowl and um, X number of migrating baird uh, uh, sandpipers, you know, in some number of um, uh, you know, wetland-dependent uh, land bird or something like that, 
um, we could probably integrate uh, into um, one design. Um, it's actually something that we're trying to work through because um, so the joint ventures have all set up um, these priority species, and, and Carol knows this being in the desert landscape, that you should, you know, we have in Playa Lakes, we have 80 priority birds. Um, Carol in the Sonoran Joint Venture has something like, you know, 300 or something like this. So to 600. do a model, what's that? More like 600. 600, sorry. I, well, all together. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, it makes it very difficult to do one model for every single species. So figuring out how you can um, do a landscape design for multiple species um, or for multiple goals, you know, is something that we're trying to um, trying to work through in our own landscape. Um, societal values. Here we're using. Um, here we were very basically talking about. Um, uh, just the idea that there's there is going to be farming on the landscape, and um, so we need to um, be directing our conservation opportunities um, in those areas where farming, you know, where producers may be willing to um, come out of production, or um, uh, you know, or be willing to protect areas that are already in grass because they're they're grazing that. Um, we didn't do a, um, a, a whole lot specific with societal values in this in the pilot, except you're just acknowledging that that farming was going to be on the landscape and that there's um, um, so there's going to be some need to continue farming. So how do we deal with that? Uh, we have done a human dimension study where we looked at um, we had focus groups of landowners throughout our uh, joint venture. And so in, we're um, working on basically doing this entire playa example for multiple drivers um, and multiple species and, and, and guild groups throughout the entire joint venture. And we're going to integrate uh, the information that we have back from the focus groups um, uh, as, as our societal values, and, and there will be some integration of the um, the aquifer and the need to conserve the aquifer uh, in that landscape design. Okay. Going down, I'm going to pause to read the next question. Okay, so this says New Mexico has a lot of different landowner types, federal, state, private, etc. How is the DLCC ensuring that its projects aren't du duplicative of others? Also, are you sharing your plans with other agencies so that they can incorporate your projects into the plans? Um, I cannot, I'll actually turn that over to Amy, um, but uh, from the PLJ. Sorry, can you, repeat, can you repeat it again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it says, Basically, how is the um, Desert Landscape uh, Conservation Cooperative ensuring that its projects aren't duplicative of others? And are you sharing your plans um, with other agencies? Um, I can answer that from a PLJV perspective, but um, yeah, why don't you go first, and then I'll go. Okay. Uh, so uh, the PLJV, our you know, our management board is structured very much like the other, like the LCC steering committees, and we have multiple different partners. And so um, we have been sharing this with our management board and with other partners outside of the management board meetings. And, um, and so, and have been talking with them about how we can integrate into, say, a swap plan or the, um, you know, use something from the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. So we're trying to um, sort of plug in where, you know, where we can fill in gaps from other plans to help, you know, target conservation uh, through this landscape design process. Okay. So um, for the Desert LCC, and so again, just to be clear that um, this 
the Playa Lakes joint venture is outside of the Desert LCC geography. So um, we're not direct partners, um, but again, the Desert LCC is looking to what others are doing um, across the country and across the continent in terms of landscape conservation design as, as we really start to think about embarking on it as a partnership. And so similar to what Ann said, the Desert LCC um, is comprised of, um, I haven't, I don't know what the latest count is, but it's well over 30 organizations um, from federal and state agencies, tribes, um, federal agencies in Mexico, non-governmental organizations, um, academics, um, or multi-sector partnership. And so we um, are right now have a sort of an ad hoc working group working on a, on a proposal for a pilot landscape conservation design within the Desert LCC. And we're looking at the opportunity to build off of the rapid ecological assessments that the Bureau of Land Management has developed in our region. Um, so we're looking at the um, potentially the Mojave ecoregion, the Sonoran, and the Madrean. Um, the first two uh, rapid ecological assessments have been completed, the Madrean is very close, and then BLM has um, is really just getting started on the Chihuahuan rapid ecological assessment. And for those of you who are not familiar, what they have done there um, is go through many of the steps of of a landscape conservation design. Again, realizing there's there's a lot of different approaches to this. Um, and so what we've invited um, our partners in the LCC to do is to um, come together to start working on this as a group. So um, by nature, we are being inclusive from the very beginning in how we approach this. Mm -hmm. I, ho I hope that answers the question. So I'll, I guess I'll just add one more thing. So um, what the proposal we're working on right now, one of the first steps in moving forward would be to um, figure out what all is out there, what's available, um, so that we can um, pull all that information together um, instead of um, replicating or duplicating something that doesn't need to be duplicated. So one of the first steps is gathering that information. Great. And we have an REA in our region, too. Um, from the BLM, and uh, yeah, as I sat in on those calls, I was like, oh my God, they're doing all the modeling for us. All we have to yeah. do is, <laughs> you know? So that's really a perfect example of how you can plug in with a partner, I think. You know, so it makes me very excited because, um, like you said, they've done a lot of the work already, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of outlining the conservation opportunities and, and the, um, you know, and, and making that into a landscape design. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of exciting, actually. It is. It is. And it's exciting to see so many different organizations and sectors starting to come together to have this conversation, to really think about how can we work better together to achieve our individual missions and goals um, and achieve things collectively that, that we couldn't do alone. So it's. I think it is very exciting. Yeah. Uh, so you had asked uh, how much did the pilot project cost and um, what partners were involved with the pilot project. So what we we had, um, I think it was about thirty thousand uh, with, uh, and that's um, grant money that covered staff time and. Uh, you know, webinars and getting data and things like that. Um, I think that might be a high estimate. I was actually not in charge of the budget on that, so uh, I'm just sort of going through the dark recesses of my memory to <laughs> come up with that number. Um, and then we had, so we were um, doing this pilot project. We had uh, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, um, some partners from NRCS, uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, Farm Services Agency. I think those are the major ones um, that were involved with the pilot. Now, when we expand this out uh, to complete the whole, uh, for the whole landscape, we'll expand that, that group of partners. Um, to include uh, USGS and all the states and, and basically everybody on our management board and then also try to get some 
participation through environmental consultants. We have some pretty good contacts with them, particularly those that work with uh, wind energy development and things of that nature. And um, that was my question. This is Carol. Um, did you do this like an advisory team, or did you have like, oh, here's a meeting and we're going to go through this set of, you know, questions, or you know, how how did they how did they put it put in their wishes and desires into the project? Yeah, we so um, we contacted uh, so we contacted members of the um, science team for the PLJV and asked uh -huh. them who they what additional partners they thought um, should be involved with the pilot, and then uh, we set up it was probably one webinar per month where we went through each step individually and just talked through it wow. and and got input and we kind of set out some ideas about, um, you know, provided some, you know, some um, landscape and, and GIS information about what's going on in Colorado and New Mexico and kind of um, said, okay, well, these are some assumptions that we thought were reasonable, um, you know, let's have a discussion about that, you know, and, um, and then took their input back and, and did the GIS modeling and then had, a, you know, at the next webinar presented the results and then talked about the next question. So it was really um, probably, it was, it was uh, very drawn out. There are definitely efficiencies to be gained in that, but since we wanted to make sure that we were uh, you know, talking through with everybody to make sure that we had hit all the right marks in, in our thinking through the process, we sort of, we, we did drag it out a bit. Um, but I think it's, it's something that you can do through, you know, um, some uh, at management board meetings or science team meetings uh, with some, you know, uh, sort of consultation in, in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm not seeing any of the questions. I was going to ask another one un unless you, you've got some that you can see, Anne. I have one more that I can see. Okay. Um, so it says, what are your thoughts about moving this landscape design into action since ultimately it is landowner action that will determine success? And um, so it's very much about um, the private landowners being willing to participate, but I think that ultimately all of our partners have to agree that this is um, – this is a plan that they're willing to act on and willing to um, you know, put their energies and their, and their people's energies behind. And so uh, we are actually moving more towards uh, what, what Mike is calling, Mike is the coordinator for the PLJV uh, client-based system. So uh, and, and this is sort of foundational to our uh, joint ventures that we don't believe that you don't just make a plan to make a plan. It needs to be actionable, and, so, and you need to be able to know that you've accomplished your goals in the plan. That's why a goal-based system is very important to us. So uh, we're looking at um, different partner uh, initiatives to try to plug in. So um, the NRCS has a, uh, an Ogallala Aquifer Initiative program and their goal, part of that uh, initiative is to conserve 250,000 uh, acres of playa wetlands. So one of our uh, landscape design plans would be around, okay, we have, you know, that's the goal for NRCS, 250,000 acres. How do we get 250,000 playa acres? And, and so I think if we are moving in that direction of just trying to plug into partners' plans and partners' initiatives, then this landscape design will move into action and will not just be, you know, something that um, occupies my time for 40 hours a week. Um, and, and, you know, when you can, you can design a plan for a client and then something like the NRCS, they have field biologists down in Alba counties and they can go and... Um, when they talk to their landowners and they talk to their um, to the folks that they their stakeholders, you know they can really um, 
sort of uh, pitch ideas that are um, you know, closer to what, what those um, folks need and what they might respond to. And we'll get them closer to their own um, their their own agency goal, which is what they're ultimately you know what the employees are going to be measured by. So um, I hope that answers your question, Laura. Um, Carol, you had another question. I was I was wanting um, to know if you have given any thought to oh, either overlays or incorporating. I think other species and and habitats kind of within that same matrix and I don't know maybe you touched upon it earlier with another question but um, we we deal with a lot of uh, habitats close to each other down here right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um Right now, we've been kind of very, uh, we've been splitters and not lumpers, and we've been splitting out the different habitats and, and working with them. But we definitely, um, uh, definitely, you know, that you can work with, um, you know, adjoining uh, habitats. One thing that we have been working with, and um, I have it in a different uh, presentation. Is we've been talking with the Forest Service in McCown's Longspur up on the Pawnee grasslands, and there's an, a lot of oil and gas development occurring in that area. So, how would we integrate U.S. Forest Service grasslands into the larger landscape of um, private landowners and oil and in, in oil and gas development? And how would we conserve this area or make sure that McCown's Long can still be supported in this area where there's going to be a lot of oil and gas. Um, so, um, so we are thinking about it and trying to work through this with other species and other landscapes. And um, and ultimately, I think that uh, you know a true landscape design involves looking at more than one driver and more than you know more than one system. You know, because all these things do interact with each other, and so we just went through a very simple example of only looking at farming, and only looking at playas. But, but obviously, a more complete uh, design would have to um, look at the whole of the landscape. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh huh. That's okay. that's good. Okay. All right. Well, it sounds like we got through the questions just in time here. So, um, Anne, thank you very much for presenting today. Um, we're already getting feedback via email that uh, folks found the information you presented very valuable and asking for the link. We will be posting this on our YouTube channel. If you search for Desert LCC YouTube, you'll find it there. And if you want to subscribe, you'll get notices when we post new webinars, um, including this one in a few days. Carol, thanks for being with us. and. Thanks to everyone else uh, for making time today. We, we appreciate your questions and your interest. So have a great week. Thanks, everybody.